In commando practice, cadet officers learn how a group of men working as one can be an effective wedge between destructive mobs and the peaceful citizen and his property. He began to see the importance of prevention whenever possible. Prevention of accidents and prevention of crime. He had proved himself to be alert, willing to take orders and carry them out, and firm but courteous in his contacts with the public. I'm asking you for your names. No. I like your name. I'm doing my job. I'm doing Okay, but we haven't done anything wrong. No, you haven't. So, We're on private property, so by the letter well, of the law, I'm asking you for your name. Okay. Just give me your name yeah. so I can just, you know, leave you guys alone. And do what you yeah, do. good. John Smith. Okay. If you guys want to play it that way, you can go out front. I'll be advising the rest of the security about you guys. If you guys make any further rules, everything will be noted and documented. Okay. In 2006, when I went to cover the Bilderberg meeting in Ottawa, I brought along a camera with me, and from then on, I knew I wanted to document more events like this that the mainstream media wasn't covering. So it was around that time that I started Press for Truth. I thought it would be a good idea to have an alternative media outlet based here in Toronto so that we can cover these various issues. Do you guys have ID? Uh, I, I do have ID. Okay. I need to see Is it possible to take a look at your driver's license? No. No, I'm afraid that it's not possible. Today is a training exercise. Um, with our tactical uh, ETF emergency task force uh, unit from Toronto Police. Uh, we're training uh, with private security. We've been doing it with uh, this organization, uh, which is our TAPS, Toronto Association of Police and Private Security Organization, which is a collaboration between Toronto Police and private security in the greater Toronto area uh, for information sharing, intelligence sharing, training opportunities. The G20 coming to this area actually helps us uh, see how our training has been uh undertaken over the last uh, several years. So this is actually, um, this was not derived as a result of the G20, but the G20 now will test our ability to work uh, in concert with private and public sector. Is it true there's going to be upwards of 10,000 police at uh, the G20? There's, uh, well first of all, I'm not here to discuss the G20. So now we are currently down in Toronto's financial district. This is the heart of the financial district here in the city. So we thought it was important to come here to show you what you can expect uh, in two months from now in this area. As many uh, of you know, there is a group out there called the Black Bloc who show up to these protests dressed in black. They often have rocks and they'll pick up things and try to smash banks. There was a fire bombing at an RBC bank uh, in Ottawa just last week uh, by a group who was calling themselves the FFFC Ottawa. You create a problem say the bombing, you get a reaction, say, oh my God, what are we gonna do about this? And then you offer your solution to the problem, which is more cameras, more security, more lockdown, and we have new CCTV cameras going up here in Toronto as a direct result of the G20. I'm George Tucker, I'm from the Toronto Police Service and I have been a police officer downtown here in 52 Division mostly for approximately 30 years. The Integrated Security Unit is the group that's comprised and required to provide the security to those internationally protected people. The Integrated Security Unit is led by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The Integrated Security Unit has security zones and they will be protected by fences. Now, over the last two weeks, uh, Toronto City workers have been working very hard putting up these fences uh, all around what is called the Red Zone. Over six kilometers of fencing uh, is going to be put in this area, which actually ended up costing over $5 million. What are these zones? There's two. One that we'll call a Red Zone, which is the most secure zone, and then there's the Outer Zone, which is less secure, but it's the largest. The world did change, unfortunately, on 911. And if it wasn't for some of the elements in our society, the security units would not have to be here in the presence that they are going to be here. We see people videotaping around here. We want to make sure what their intentions are. Yep. Our intention is to provide some alternative information to people who are looking to learn about the G20. 
as opposed to the mainstream media slant on things. Are you familiar with the with what an agent provocateur is? Well, in Montebello, Quebec in 2007, um, there was three police officers who were dressed as aggressive protesters with rocks in their hands, wearing masks, in an attempt to incite violence. These three guys are cops, everybody! George, as a representative of the Toronto Police, can you assure us that the Toronto Police Force uh, will not engage in any um, police uh, agent, uh, provocateur agent activities at the G20 Summit? Security matters, I'm not at liberty to, those, to discuss those that are open for that. Obviously with these people coming to town, this is a huge international event. It puts Toronto on the global stage. We obviously have to take the steps that we deem necessary to provide that protection for them to visit Canada. Charlie, hey, sir, this is a non-filming area. Uh-oh. Do you know we spent a billion dollars securing this? You can't have this. <laughs> How are you, man? Very well. Yeah, good to good. meet you. Good, good to meet you, man. My name is uh, Charlie Veach. I'm a member of the Love Police, Detective Charlie Veach. Terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Al-Qaeda, Mohammed, terrorism. I'd like to thank the City of London Police for doing a wonderful job in their fluorescent jackets and protecting us all from the terrorists. You have CCTV cameras filming us. We have to ask the question, people. Who's watching the watchers? So, Dan, you live here in Toronto? I do. Been here for a little over 10 years now, 12 years or so. It's funny, we're still one day away from the actual event and it's already massively locked down. Yeah, massive is an understatement. This is a completely unprecedented amount of police. I've never seen anything like it. All right, well, thanks. Um, uh, well, uh, I'll see you in jail. We would like to know where the best riots are. Because what we really want to capture is like really frontline footage of the riots. We have got very rubbish footage so far. Most of it is unusable. If you know where there's any good riots, please let us know. Thank you. Can you tell me there are gonna be riots? I'm sure there are going to be some intense riots. So we're just wondering if you guys knew where they might be. Well, if you got some ID with you, I can put you in touch with media. Thing is, though, um, why do I need to show you ID? So I can give your name to media so you can be contacted? Oh, no, in that case, I'd rather remain anonymous. Really, eh? Yeah. But can I please give one of you guys a hug? No. No? no. And you, can I give you a hug? No. No. OK, well, that's what we'd like okay, to do. But... So you guys are going to be on your way then down that yeah, way? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? That'd be a good idea. All the best. Have a good day. Take care. See you tomorrow at the riots. Well, I'm kind of amazed, Dan, just that the intense police presence and the incredible kind of Berlin Wall style gating going on here. You can really almost taste the money they've wasted on the policing and surveillance of the city. And as we saw walking past, they've got mobile CCTV units. We've been, you've been, I mean, you've been stopped today twice, asked for ID, asked to who you are. I've been stopped once. So I'm just really looking forward to getting the megaphone out and uh, speaking a bit of uh, my supposed truth to the poor security personnel here. Absolutely. So let's continue our trip down to uh, blast the people with some truth. With Charlie B. We're going to press for truth. Ladies and gentlemen, you must respect the G20. The group of 20 industrialized and soon to be industrialized nations have your best interests at heart. Trust me, globalization is good for business. Shop faster! Get your credit cards ready! We have to pay back $1 billion that we spent on policing you for the G20 summit. Please be very careful. The person standing next to you could either be a terrorist or might have swine flu. Stay terrified. I'd just like to thank security for coming out in such wonderful uniforms. They are agents from the Matrix. If you don't mind stepping on public property, I can leave you alone and you guys... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where, where's public property? Five feet that way. Yeah, of course. Is it just behind that gray line? Yeah, you got it. Have a good one. We have been moved on a total of three meters. We were standing on corporate private property. Now my message is ruined. You cannot hear my megaphone because I have been moved three meters to the left. It's all over now. The man has shut me down. It's all over. Excuse me, sir, with the camera, you're actually on private property there. Anyone telling you to firebomb McDonald's is dangerous and should be disobeyed. I repeat, do not 
Fireball McDonald's. Do not rock the boat. Do not ask difficult questions. If you require answers, the CBC and your other propaganda channels have all the answers for you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a message brought to you by the Canadian Institute for Shopping and Buying Rubbish You Do Not Need. Giorgio Armani, Gucci, Prada, Dolce & Gabbana. These are your new priests in the church of consumerism. Anyone exiting the Eaton Centre without five shopping bags is a rubbish shopper. What you need is to turn around and make your way back into the Eaton Centre. Ladies and gentlemen, by order of Eaton Mall Management, we ask you to shop faster. You are not spending your money at a quick enough pace. Spend more money. Buy more material objects. Happiness lies in buying stupid things you do not need. Thank you. Enjoy your shopping experience. Okay, that's good. Sorry? Thanks a lot. Let's move on. Ladies and gentlemen, the agent from the Matrix behind me has said, okay, let's move on now. Just for the agent from the Matrix to know, of course, this is nothing personal. We do not dislike human beings, but what we do dislike is how uniforms make human beings behave like bullies. The people in the nice black and white uniforms behind me that say security, they are asking us, do not point your camera at the building because the building has feelings as well and it's very shy today. We would like to announce we are not terrorists. We are in fact British military intelligence. We are from MI7. Look us up. Thank you. Yeah, we're from British military intelligence. I'm here with the Metropolitan Police. As you can see, so it's, uh, it's all fully authorized at the highest levels. Because you know sometimes, um, have you heard of what an agent provocateur is? I have no idea. What it is, sometimes in like when there's big demonstrations, because I can tell you this because you're security, they use um, fake protesters to cause trouble, and we're here to be those um, fake protesters. Okay, I understand so it's that. fully authorized. I understand that you have a certification, there's a oh, yellow no, card that press is supposed to have? No, we're not pressed because we're undercover, and if we carried ID around, when you know, we might get searched right, by well, protesters. But you so. have actual ID on you? No, we don't carry ID. We're like, you don't carry go. ID on your, in your wallet or on the, your person in anywhere? The or? In the spy world, we call them ghosts, and we are ghosts. I'm oh, sorry, uh, what would you say you're uh, working for? Or? Uh, I can't say. If you're going to radio that in, we're undercover, you know. So, it's best not to say. Okay, hold on a second. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Police Entertainment Division. We know that securing Toronto City Centre against all those anarchists and terrorists can get very boring. So we are here to remind you that everything is okay, that we are on your side, and that what we want to see in the next few days, we want to see a fair riot between the police and the protesters. We ask that no one gets truly hurt, because as we know, all this is international politics. It's all street theatre anyway. And we all know as well that being a policeman in central Toronto right now can be very stressful. So if you'd like to join us to do some yoga, we'll be doing some tantric med meditation. We will even show you some nice new positions which you can take home and make your partner very happy with. All you need to do is speak to the man with the megaphone. We are the love police and our job is to lower fear and raise love. Honestly, we're done. Off the property, please. Oh, what, 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 happened? what happened? What happened? This is private property? Okay. Yes, it is, sir. It's private so property. Where would public property be? Pri private property, sir. Yeah, where would public property be? Yeah. Sidewalk right there. We would like to apologize for standing on private property. We had no idea. We have obeyed now. We are on public property. Sorry for ever causing any trouble, but we promise we are not terrorists. That's actually the first time. Hello. How are you guys? Good. Good. How's your good. Good. Very well, sir. Uh, we're, um... Well, these guys are from Press for Truth, and I'm from the Love Police. We're kind of absurdist, surrealist filmmakers, and so we obviously it's came to Toronto for the G20 to, to try and uh, <laughs> see what kind of exciting. So you know what it is. is. Oh, okay. You found anything exciting so far? Well, just a bunch of private security telling us we're on private property. Police have been super cool. It's just the private security seems to be a bit stressed about everything. Well, as it turns out, yeah. you're currently filming, correct? Yep. You can't do that right here. So, uh, they told us this was uh, 
Can I just ask a question, please, sir? From this particular um, wall. Can I please look uh, at the actual paper? That's all. Can, 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 can I please see your identification, sir? Is it accurate? We're both human beings. Fingers. But are we not equal before the law until someone I've asked the you law? to turn the camera on. I don't anticipate any trouble yeah. whatsoever. And that's it. I hope that sounds yeah. fair and is with fair with everybody. Yeah. Right? So, could, who's got, is can you? Is he being detained right now, or? He's just talking, same thing that, I've okay. asked you to stop filming, brother, come on. I, I appreciate what you guys I'm are just doing, concerned I know it's very safety. interesting. Yeah. You have nothing to worry about with his safety. Okay. okay. So no one's in trouble? No, okay. no, right? No one's in trouble. Well, we're not doing anything illegal, right? Exactly, right? Keep up the good work, though, right? This guy's doing a really good job. Sure. Thanks. So your friend didn't want to tell the police who he was. So he's been arrested for the time being, okay? okay. So they're going to determine who he is, and then once they determine who he is, he'll be released. Oh, that's that's beautiful thing about this. Bravo, you know, this can, November. Uh, uh, I agree. We don't have to help, present uh, our papers upon request. Uh, in November. Well, under, but <laughs> circumstances have changed just a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, but like why, if this was a, why would certain if rights be suspended just because the G20 is coming yeah. to town? Right? Because that's what the government states. Right. It's not us. We don't make the rules. Yeah, we just play by it. So as you probably just saw, we were uh, surrounded by, I don't know, about 15 police officers or so who said we could not be on the property and that we had to be on uh, the public sidewalk. Uh, we went over to the public sidewalk, uh, continued doing our bullhorning with Charlie Beach, and uh, that's when they, they said it's time to put a stop to this and you guys are going to have to tell us who you are and show us your identification under something that is called the uh, Protection Public, Public, Protection. Public Protection Act. The Public Works Protection Act, as it's called, isn't new, but extending it broadly to downtown city blocks is unprecedented. It's, it's entirely reasonable and that we would be able to restrict the area around the summit. We have a legislative responsibility to protect that event. Police are using it. Several people have been arrested. Andrew Beach, an activist, tested the police response and videotaped it. Within five meters of this wall, so please turn off your video camera. We can't film within five meters of the wall? That's correct. So your friend didn't want to tell the police who he was, so he's been arrested for the time being. As of June 21st, sir, this June June declared a public works uh, area. Okay. And then that falls under the Public Works Act. Which is, what's the act exactly? The Public Works Act. Sir. Right, so what is it? State? You're, you're more than welcome to look it up on the internet, sir. Can I get you to explain the, um, I think it's the Sorry, Property, um, Property Workplace Act? I would have to refer you to the, uh, to the uh, Public Works, you're talking about the Public Work Act. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, I would have to refer you to the Media Relations Officer, I won't be able to. Oh, no one can speak on that? No. Oh. Sorry. Okay. It's actually under the Public Works Protection Act, okay? Okay. Anyone within this perimeter. So by law, you can ID anybody you yeah. want? Yes, that's right. Can I have your ID, please? Um, I, I refuse to give you my ID. Okay. You're going to have to identify yourself to me, sir. Listen, this okay, this is the way This is the way it happens, okay? If you don't identify yourself to me, then under that act, I'm going to have to arrest you. Arrest me for not showing ID? That's right. So I need to see your ID right now. We yeah. check your bag, there's nothing in it that can cause anyone any harm. You're free to enjoy yourself in the park. You don't open your bag, you don't get in. Well, I'm not letting you illegally search me. Okay, then you're not coming in. The then you're not coming in. Why? On whose authority? On whose authority? We're not going to repeat ourselves over and over and over again. Thanks, this is a violation of charter rights. Of rights as a citizen of Canada, you are violating my rights by illegally searching me. And I have a right to enter a public space without being violated. You have a right to enter the public space under the terms that we've given you. That's the end. Oh, your legal terms that you've given me. Well, sir, I guess that's up for debate no, we're later, not, well, but today, right now, as it stands, those are the rules, and if we are incorrect, and it's found out to be incorrect, then we will apologize to no, no, and it goes from there. We're gonna break the law, and then deal with the consequences later. That's essentially what you just said to me. I'm going sir, to enter this park, and you will have to detain me yes, to enter my bag. That's correct. Okay. Well, then you're done. No, you're going to have to detain me. Sure. 
that you're keeping his goggles? He's not are you here keeping to my goggles? Yes. Why, why are you keeping my goggles? Is it illegal to have goggles? So when you use chemical weapons, I won't be able to protect myself? No, I don't have all of my stuff. Give me my goggles back. You're not getting your goggles back. Why? Unless you want to give us your name, we'll give you a property. Why do you need my name? Because I'm breaking so the law. What law? Can you please tell me what law? We can't, we can't even have this one. Okay. 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 Toronto has been turned into a police state. I mean, there are just police everywhere. They're searching you, uh, your knapsacks when you come into a park. They're asking for your identity. These are public relations exercises that are increasingly about intimidation. I mean, intimidation may be the main message here. Not anything else that's going to come out of it. telling us where we can march instead of letting us go where we want to go. Then people go home because they don't want to deal with this, which is totally understandable. Tell us a little bit about what happened to you when you got detained there and just explain the ordeal that you went through. Yeah, I was just a bit too slow to show my identification and I made the terrible, terrible criminal error, like real violent error of asking the policeman if he could show me some identification first. Uh, I spent five hours sat on a bench in the Union Street Station security office uh, under CCTV surveillance. They're recording everything. And uh, they kept me there for five hours on the wooden bench with my hands tied behind my back with handcuffs. After that, they sent an immigration detective down from the Canadian immigration because they said that I was in the country illegally, that they had no record of my entry into Canada. So then I got thrown in the back of a van again with the handcuffs still behind my back and driven for about 15 minutes to the Toronto Film Studios. But I didn't know it was the Toronto Film Studios until I left. They strip searched me again. In, a, a sergeant interviewed me under CCTV again. Then I got taken into this um, massive open room about the size of two football pitches, like black everywhere. And they'd set up like strip lighting, fluorescent lighting. And above each cage, they had two CCTV cameras and a little uh, toilet in the corner with cameras pointing at that as well. And it was like something out of the X-Files. It was like something out of a horror movie, a place where like an Area 51 where they'd house aliens or something. Because it was like dark and scary and really cold. I can't believe I've had such a lengthy incarceration custodial sentence over something which I think we can all agree is quite minor. It's my first time ever in Canada. I was in the country for one day. It was a massive um, miscommunication between myself and the guard or peace officer. Okay. I was fully willing to give my ID, just not in this, the, the aggressive manner he was wanting. And now I've had the longest, uh, well, a very long prison sentence already in my opinion, and I'm very stressed, very upset. Okay. And it just doesn't feel very becoming of a civilized country like Canada. I've been held in a cage, a cold cage in a warehouse for many hours. And before that, I had my hands cuffed behind my back for four hours before I got brought here. And it doesn't no, feel right. I appreciate really your comments. There are some, unfortunately, some exceptional circumstances within the city right now, but I do appreciate your comments. You can't make, you can't make me sleep in concrete. That's the arrangements we have. It's, it's a temporary facility. Temporary right facility. It's not like a regular police station. This, you treat me like this is Guantanamo Bay. Like this isn't right. I'm going to make some very big complaints. You well, can't you're perfectly treat entitled to, sir. But you can't treat human beings like this. Sir, I'm just going to ask you to step here. I'm just going to re secure you and escort you to so. So then after the judge said I was okay to be released, they put me in jail again for another three hours. And I was only released at midday the following day. So for not showing my identification quickly enough, 
21 hours in jail in a kind of makeshift Guantanamo Bay kind of warehouse. June 23rd, I was at Jack Astor's following a baseball game. I went to a baseball game for my friends. I uh, spoke to two female RCMP officers and I asked them where they were from and they were unresponsive. They didn't have anything to say. So in passing, I just stated, good luck with Saturday. And uh, it, nothing happened. We got into my cab. Right at the corner here of Front and Simcoe, the cab was stopped by a Toronto police car. And at that point, I was taken by the arm. And a line of questioning began. First questions were, what are you doing in the area? And I explained, uh, I was here with a baseball game. Going to my, I was in the cab going to my girlfriend's house. At that point, they put me in handcuffs and basically said, we're going to ask you some questions. The arresting officer was asking me questions about what I allegedly said to the RCMP officers. Then two female officers literally got in my face and said, you don't remember telling us good luck with Saturday? And at that point, I was like, yeah, I said that. And what transpired next was just beyond unbelievable. I never thought that anything like this could ever happen to me. During the booking, I knew that, you know, this wasn't a valid arrest. They, uh, they went into my pockets, took my ID out. They didn't even ask me for my ID in the streets, just helped themselves to it. Uh, didn't tell me why I was being arrested, tell me what I was being arrested with, but no explanation. While they were questioning me on the street, uh, I didn't want to say anything. I said, I'd rather remain silent. You know, I don't know what this is all about. I want to speak to a lawyer or duty counsel. Uh, that was the wrong answer. That's what made me go to 52 Division. And a booking sergeant from around the table came around, grabbed me by the neck, while the two arresting officers held me by the shoulders, took me to a room directly behind me, uh, shut the door. I asked them what they were doing, and they said, we're strip searching you. It wasn't, uh, please take your clothes off. It wasn't, there was no explanation. As soon as the door shut, the booking sergeant staff began beating me in the face. Every time he hit me in the face, he would use an open hand, kicked me in the legs, beat me in the torso. I have uh, defensive bruising just from being like this. Uh, at no point did I fight back. I had three guys, two guys holding me, one guy literally beating me up. They just tore my clothes off. They didn't say, you know, take your clothes off, we want to strip search you. They didn't explain. The shirt was ripped open, literally grabbed me by the bottom of my hands, flipped me like this so that the back of my head hit the concrete floor. Uh, I completely ripped my clothes off. At this point, I'm completely naked. I have one man sitting on me, beating me like this, while the other two are holding me down. At that point, you know, I sat around naked for five hours, and one of the arresting officers, uh, I believe 8330, if I'm correct, I don't have the information here, but came and asked me to stand, stood. He took my underwear, which was up against the wall, and kicked it underneath the cell and told me to get decent because two. Uh, what he explained were detectives were coming to ask me some questions. I asked them for their IDs and if they were in fact Toronto police officers because they were in plain clothes. And they just took the stance that, um, listen, we can either help you out with this or you can, you can kind of continue this way and you're going to get no help. So I just said, okay, that's fine. If I could just have your names. And they looked at each other and one of the officers said, I'm Officer C and this is Officer Six. They sat me down and started asking questions about what I know, what, what is going to happen on Saturday, if I know any information, if I don't know any information about labor groups, if I belong to a labor group. I had no answers. So you were arrested and detained, thrown in a cruiser, beaten up, strip searched, all because uh, you said good luck on Saturday. Good luck with Saturday. Big protest expected, big march expected uh, this afternoon. Uh, and we're going to check in now with Stephen D'Souza, who's been monitoring it for us uh, from the Queen's Park area. That's the Ontario legislature in downtown Toronto. Stephen, what can you tell us? There are, 10, there are at least 10,000 people who have gathered here for a range of issues, everything from anti-war to the environment. Labour groups are here. A number of various uh, 
ethnic groups. There are so many people here all gathered to protest the G20. I want to bring in uh, one guest here who's uh, Zoe Caron from WWF Canada. And your issue is the environment and climate change hasn't really been on the agenda here. So what, what do you have to say to the G8 and G20 leaders? Well, it's the first time in a very long time that climate change has been pushed off of the agenda. We're hoping that countries will be coming out with their commitments. India came out yesterday, big deal. They said they're going to phase out their subsidies to oil and gas. U.S. is pushing it really hard. They're going to save $54 billion in the next five years by phasing out those same subsidies. So we're hoping Canada will follow suit. Follow suit. We have $2 billion a year in those subsidies. And then we can transition those funds to go towards renewable energy and climate change funds. Thank you very much, Zoe. Good luck with your, good luck with your protest this week. So, Peter, there you have it. The crowd is just marshalling. They just finished up the speeches here, so the crowd is just marshalling now. They're going to head south on University Avenue towards the fence where the uh, pro where the summit site is, but they're going to stop a few blocks away and head uh, west before I circling around. Job. But uh, I can say, though, that while about 98% of the people here are going to be peaceful, we do know that there are some elements who have uh, posted online and uh, who have spoken out saying that they aren't going to make that turn and are going to continue straight towards the fence and they are groups that are anarchists who do not believe that the G8 and the G20 are a legitimate organization and they're going to cause some trouble later today and so we're going to be keeping a close eye out for that. Continue north? No. Okay. Can Alice we go this way? To by way of arrest. You're going to go south to, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that you go down to King. All right then. Okay. And then go east or west because unfortunately you're going to be meeting a lot of police officers along the way and you're going to be getting direction. Okay. We're trying to make our way to the protest. It won't happen here. Uh, what won't? You won't be making it to the protest from here. Okay. So we got to get there another solid way. All the way across. Oh. You can tell your friends that as well. So head that direction. Hmm. Sure. All right. Freedom of speech. We are now in the thick of it, behind the front lines, along Queen Street. Uh, we managed to get up in behind uh, the police line that you can see behind me. We have a lot of riot police all geared up. Is that it? Yeah. Where, where are you going now? Thank you very much, sir. I'll stay south here, okay? Okay. If you try and disobey, they have some very, very painful-looking metal truncheon extendable sticks at the ready. These things are not sheathed in their clothing. They are holding their weapons out, ready to use. I live, like, literally right there. I know, and I, I can't help you at the moment. I can't even light it through. And I know it's a real pain. We are friendly. Yeah, well, you are. Thank you. Follow everybody else for your safety. Yes, we're not saying it for the hell of it. Please keep moving. 
you do not leave, I will have you arrested for obstructing a police officer. Okay. This, for your, this, me, this is for your safety, people, that we're asking you to move back. Charlie and I are having a pretty difficult time of getting anywhere near any kind of front lines. And we keep being turned around at every corner. Um, they're constantly sending us back, pushing us back, pushing us back. So we're going to head down south and try to get over across uh, from another route. Every route that is traveling west that travels north-south uh, is actually blocked off. You can't really see it at the moment. Uh, we are blocked off into this one area. We've got mounted police to my left. On the other side, riot police, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of riot police on foot, in vehicles, on horses, on bikes, on motorcycles. They are absolutely everywhere. A direct action should be concrete. We should do things that aren't symbolic, but rather accomplish things here and now. Directly shut something down, or at least cause so much financial damage that our message gets to the CEOs. What's your message? Our message is that commodification of life is wrong, dominionism is wrong, capitalism is wrong, and that all beings desire freedom. I gotta go.
Freedom of press. up university that's where i see the vans pull up a huge row of vans of uh, riot cops and they pull up really fast and as i cross the street i see the black block walking down college street this was probably right after they smashed the toronto police headquarters the black block gets there i cross the street and there's one van just parked by itself like and that's to me that sort of seemed like a setup I could see the cops starting to get out of the vans across the street, the riot cops. And then they sort of formed one of those lines again. And then something happened with the black, like a lot of the people that were smashing the van would like run into Queens Park. And it's like sort of like you lose, you lose track of them. I guess a lot of them were changing because there was a pile of black clothes. I can definitely say that I saw that. So for about an hour and a half, a group of maybe, you know, 50, uh, 50 kids we're purposely allowed to vandalize, uh, you know, the entire city, go do as much vandalism as they wanted. Uh, the police were ordered to stand down, uh, as had come out in a Toronto Sun article, um, where a policeman said, yes, we were ordered to stand down, we could have easily rounded up all these kids. There is an article in the Toronto Sun where officers were told to stand down and not engage violent protesters. So there are members of the police that feel that it was not right for them either. I, I think with the number of police that were here, and some of them have shared their opinions in the sun, that they could have clamped down on that quite quickly and allowed for legitimate protests to continue. Um, we need to ask why that wasn't done. We need to ask who gave those orders, because there are people in the police force that don't even know who gave their orders. And that's frustrating for them, and I think that's a dangerous spiral to go down. Um, there's also questions about the police cars that were left abandoned. And I think those are valid questions. I know that they they want to swipe them off as conspiracy theories, but when you have that many police cars um, left in an area and, and people see that there's no police stopping what's going on, you have to answer as to why that was. How an hour and a half of uh, destruction happens with police looking on and doing nothing, I find more than highly suspect. Uh, maybe if they were involved, yeah, there's more. Uh, there's more than reason to believe that. And it, and if and if and if they weren't, they still let it happen. One way or another, we all have an obligation to find out what the truth is. I don't care what side of the political fence you're on. You should care about the truth. Hey, 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 
Warning that whole line of fully seated riot cops ran toward us at full speed, the bike cops included. Um, within a matter of seconds, they were on my heels yelling, Go faster, you're gonna get hurt, go faster, we're gonna gas you. And it made me feel a way that I've never felt before in my own country. I was absolutely afraid of the police. Then without warning, they started advancing and, and grabbing people randomly, and they started sending horses in, into the crowd where at least a few people were injured. Uh, one woman was trampled, I believe her leg was broken. Uh, somebody else I saw got, get kicked by one of the officers on the horse. And of course, you know, they just started advancing and grabbing people randomly and then advancing more and without ever communicating to us why they were doing it. There was, ever, there was never any order to disperse from Queen's Park issue. Um, myself and other people kept yelling at the police, asking for somebody to come forward that speaks for the police to communicate why they were doing what they were doing, why they were starting to become aggressive with this. But there was never any any negotiator or anybody stepped forward. It seemed like like it was just something that was taking on a life of its own. that was taken they need to explain why they need to explain who made that decision and if the Canadian public don't want to see that on their soil they have to put measures into place that that'll never be repeated again you know this is a global corporate fascist takeover um, and we saw their enforcers uh, firsthand here in Toronto with the G20 and uh, you know if you read the stories or you know listen to some of these interviews or anything like that you'll realize it was just you know a bunch of thugs came in and uh, you know, criminal thugs started beating up, assaulting, arresting, uh, and horribly treating a bunch of peaceful, innocent uh, Canadians. You know, they, they ripped the leg off a 57-year-old amputee and told them to hop to the squad car and arrested them. And you were a government employee, right? Yeah, I worked for the Canada Revenue Agency. Oh, okay. I'm in the appeals section there. I'm a, an above-the-me amputee, and the police surrounded us. And, and the two young gentlemen were trying to help me get up. I fell down, I lost my balance, and I was trying to get up again. And next thing you know, there were uh, four police jumped right on top of me. One of them uh, put his knee on the top of my left temple and was just sort of like grinding me into the ground with his knee. Uh, they had knocked my glasses off, and I was yelling that my glasses were loose. And, and, uh, and then the police said, well, well, you're resisting arrest. And he said, uh, let go of your arm or else I'm going to break it. And, and, but he just, and I said, I can't, I can't move. The police officer told me to walk, and I told him I can't. He, then he grabbed my uh, left leg here, and he ripped it off. So then he orders me to hop, and I said, I can't. And then he said, you asked for it. So uh, two police came and they grabbed me under the shoulders like this. And then they started dragging me backwards to where they all had the police vans parked. And my elbows were digging after a while into the pavement. And I was screaming. I was in a lot of pain. They hoisted me up in the air 
And then they started hitting me, I guess with their batons or whatever, or their fists. And as they were running me towards the police van, they were saying things like, he's a biter, he's a spitter, he's resisting arrest. So we got up to the police van, they threw me on the ground, and they started giving me these little boots with their boots and hitting me. And I was held at the detention center for over 24 hours. I was never charged. Uh, they said they couldn't find my arrest, uh, the paperwork, the, my, my arrest report, they never could find it. They never allowed me a phone call or, or any of that stuff. They wouldn't let me wear, wear my leg. Uh, they said it could be used as a weapon or it might have a weapon inside of it. I felt brutalized when I went through it, when they took me down the, the, the way they did it. Uh, I mean, if they had tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're under arrest, I would, you know, it would, I would have complied. For a day, there was no need to do what they did. And you can see that people are being pushed out of Queen's Park uh, by police. So rather than being penned in here, we decided to kind of retreat to the streets, to a, a place that was a, a more public space and that was not under immediate control by the police. When we got to Bloor, we headed east and then eventually to Young Street where we turned south. And at that point, the protest started snaking. So basically, we kind of uh, changed the game up a bit. Uh, we, you know, we forced the cops to react to us rather than being able to predict where we were going. So we would zig or zag if we uh, started seeing a police lineup down the street. Welcome to the new world order. You will do as you are told. Do not rock the boat. Do not question authority. Toronto Police, you are as much victims of this global empire as we are. The true criminals you want to arrest are within the summit exclusion zone. to the guy just there in the black paramilitary uniform holding a MP5 submachine gun. Sir, why have you brought a live firing weapon to a peaceful protest? Why is the government trying to antagonize peaceful people by bringing live weapons to a protest? Uh, there are little pockets all over the city uh, things that are going on right now are not being contained in any one particular area. We have heard that there have been people setting um, police cruisers on fire. What's fishy about it? Well, I was here three hours ago and the cars are sitting there and they're not burned. Next thing the police scatter, then one car is burned, they come back, of course, everybody out. And then they leave again, and then the other car is burned. Like, why do they pull the cars out of here? They had enough manpower to get everybody out of here, and then they just scattered. I don't understand it. If they're looking for a photo op. Why is the CBC news van still there? They uh, still have the CBC news van right beside the flaming vehicle, but they've cleared everybody else out. So a little bit curious there that they still want the mainstream media right beside the flaming police car. It was a photo op for the media so that they can... I'm, I'm telling you, the car was on fire for a long, long time. No cops around, no fire trucks. It was allowed well, to I'm going to tell you why no cops around, because they were running the other way. If you were a firefighter, would you would you like to go in there and try to put that uh, Absolutely. car? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's, there's lots of fire trucks around. That's what they got to do. You don't back up, my man. Somebody go to rescue. So here we are. We 
we've just marched all the way down Young Street. We're back where we started at Dundas Square. Uh, we started here about nine hours, ten hours ago. About uh, 10, 10.30, I was walking down by uh, Queen Street and Church Street, by Queen and Church. There was about 16 police officers all around a light pole that was blinking and shorting out. So I said over the megaphone, I said, uh, $1 billion to uh, defend a blinking light. One of the group members, he had the megaphone, uh, and he was ahead of me. And he didn't even get like one or two words out of the megaphone and immediately they jumped him. They grabbed my head and smashed it against the wall like uh, pretty damn hard. And uh, before I could even get up, they grabbed me by the throat and started choking me. He fell on top of me and I landed on top of the megaphone. And uh, about four or five cops all jumped up, stacked up on me. Three of them turned around towards me and they extended their batons immediately and they hit me with their batons three times in my chest. And um, they beat the chair relentlessly. Uh, continually beating the chair, telling me to turn around, turn around, like, get the F out of here. And I tried to blurt my phone number out to a friend, and I was told that uh, if I were to say anything, that he would have to hold my neck in a position in which I would be unable to breathe. I was trying to turn around, and they almost pulled, they, they almost pushed me out of my chair as I was turning around, continually beating the chair. And when I finally was able to turn around and actually start to wheel away, they can still continued to hit the chair, and. They didn't stop until I was actually within um, at least 100 feet of them. They arrested me for disturbing the peace, but it was before 11 o'clock, so I'm allowed, it's not a noise complaint or anything. Uh, I can use my free speech. Um, they broke the megaphone, so this is what free speech in Canada looks like. Probably 10 to 15 hours I stayed in the cell, I was denied a phone call. I kept asking for my phone call. They wouldn't have read me my rights unless uh, I actually brought it up and I said to them, hey, nobody's read me my rights, this is illegal. It was really intimidating and I'm surprised that this was in my country. Before we knew it, the streets started filling with sort of with riot cops, guys in tactical gear, started getting pretty scary. Um, we weren't really sure where to go. There was a, a group of about 200 people marching away uh, from the security fence and, and heading east and we live east and uh, they were chanting peaceful protests so we, we joined up with them. Uh, there were some really cool people in the crowd and we just sort of were getting ushered down uh, south and ended up on the esplanade in front of uh, Novotel and people were singing, give peace a chance, all this kind of stuff and uh, it was really cool, there was no, there was no violence. And you have buildings on either side but no real means of escape except for the, the actual streets and the police blocked us off with one phalanx and then blocked us off with the other and then started closing in. Before we knew it we were barricaded in on both sides by uh, riot cops who wouldn't answer any questions, wouldn't let us go. Uh, they, they, they were just completely stone-faced and one of them even said, you should have gone, you should have left when we told you to, although they never told us to. And This couple came out of the keg restaurant and tried to leave and they said, it's too late. And the couple was like, what the hell is going on? Let us go! Let us go! Let us go! We were boxed in and then we were pulled out one by one and arrested individually and then eventually just uh, kind of conquered and, and uh, mass arrested. All these 200 people end up getting arrested. It doesn't matter if you were passing through or if you lived in the condo or coming out of the restaurant. Uh, they wouldn't listen to you. Uh, some guy tried to show ID that he lived in that condo and they shot some pepper bullets at his feet and all these people went running and screaming into the Novotel. <laughs> The police never attempted to communicate with us, they never spoke to us. 
And there was never any violence or, or destruction on our part either. I had to watch my girlfriend dragged away uh, and, and cuffed as they dragged her away, uh, really roughly for absolutely no reason, threw her in a paddy wagon. Uh, I got thrown in a paddy wagon and, and before I knew it I was in a prison bus full of guys taken down to the detention center. I ended up being in that detention center for 24 hours. I couldn't believe what was happening. Um, obviously, this is the kind of stuff that we don't stand for whatsoever. This does not help our cause. This does not uh, help the situation. It provides an excuse for uh, the authorities to clamp down even harder uh, on our rights. Dan and I got searched three times in 30 minutes and had our IDs checked and radioed in. It's a predictive programming to train the public in urban areas to comply, to allow arbitrary searches of your bags, to go through checkpoints, to have police radio you in and have to give your details. Dan was actually very good today. A female police officer um, said, can we search your bag? And Dan said, no. Do you mind if I take a peek? I sort of do. Totally up to you. Is, is that not part of the Public Protection Works Act? Or uh, it's not mandatory for me to show you? Nope. Is that, all right, well, I'd rather not. Then. And then five minutes later, another police officer said, yeah, you have to comply or you'll both be arrested. And so we both had our bags searched three times. You're checking everybody after yesterday, guys. Is it mandatory now? Yes. Well, another officer well, just told me it wasn't. Let's have a look. Okay. Sure. We're here for your safety as well as everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. It does leave a slight bad taste in our mouth to be arbitrarily searched in a free country, in a free area. I want to stay, further, then open your bag. I, I thought as long as he's not within the five meters, though, it's yeah. fine. Isn't that the case? That's the this is our area. Five meters, I don't right? I, I, that's the way you go. Is that? Because I won't consent to a search, so I'll leave. Why are you, you, don't get a, you don't get a choice. Yeah, get moving. Why are you grabbing me, man? Get moving. <laughs> civil rights uh, violated. There's no civil rights here in this area. Yes, there are. How many times you got to be told that? That's on, but there are. That's within five years of the fence, there's yeah. no civil rights. That's what the legislation said on Monday. If that was the rule, we'd all be behind the fence. My understanding is the Public Works Act applies to five okay. years of the fence. Sure. I'm asking you to do that. Zero. Portable number 61749. The range is uh, 3550. Five, five, five. You don't have anything on you? No weapons or anything? No, I don't have anything on me. I'm now being searched and duress. I shouldn't have to be searched. I mean, I understand the situation today. So well, you want to go through your pockets or anything? Well, well you still patted through. me down. and yeah, that's, well, that's for my safety, right? If we refuse to surrender identification outside of the five meter boundary of the fence, yeah. that would be an arrestable offense, though, right? But you know what? You know what? If you've got nothing to hide, just out here doing whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's within our rights, isn't it? I understand, I understand that's yeah. within your rights. But what I'm saying is, if you if you give an officer a hard time, yeah. uh, I I think that you're hiding something uh, for whatever reasons. <laughs> so if, if you've got nothing to hide, and uh, we want to check Well, that's why I gave, I gave over my identification yeah, no, saying, and subjected you, myself to a search. If you refuse, but, yeah. um, then we start thinking, okay? arrests and lots of them hundreds at last count over 500 and they are still making them as we speak 
This morning, highlighted by an arrest at the University of Toronto campuses, where police uh, took in at least 70 people who they said were storing street weapons on campus. I uh, came out of where I was sleeping uh, and identified myself uh, as a member of the student union, uh, and I was escorted out. Uh, I talked to a police officer, I guess who was in charge, uh, who was evasive. I, I said, I, I want to see a, a warrant, and he's, he was being evasive and saying that we were trespassing. Um, I said, no, we're not. This is our building. Uh, these are our guests. Uh, and then just looking for excuses, excuses, and finally uh, got frustrated and just said, okay, everybody here is under arrest. We were arrested in the campus, and the charge were uh, conspiracies to come in, and we didn't know what we conspiracy to come in. Mm -hmm. So. They were actually in a gymnast that they have rented and they got arrested and when the police arrest them they say that they arrest them for participating into a riot. Yep. My name is Mark, I'm uh, from Montreal, Quebec. I've been arrested on the G20s. Um, the charge against me are weapons. My weapons are a pair of tweezers, a waistcut this big, two pairs of scissors and a metal whistle. Rallies that we have had in the past 24 hours where people are going to the jails to support their friends as they leave. We are finding that cops are also meeting them there with brutality. We've seen plain clothed cops snatch several demonstrators who were supporting their peers coming out of jail. We've seen them being snatched, being thrown into cars. We have seen cops prepared with tasers. This is not acceptable when we are already resisting the G8 and G20 violence, the violence that comes from their structures and policies. touches me, they're going to be arrested for assault. Do you understand? Bubbles. Yes, that's right. It's a deliberate act on your behalf. I'm going to arrest you. Do you understand me? Right, you're going to be in handcuffs. All right? You either knock it off with the bubble, you touch me with that bubble, you're going into custody. I don't feel very I'm just... That's terrible. Trying to... My heart bleeds. Mine too. Right? I'm here. Put it away. Right. Away. right. You're at it. Knock it off. Yeah. For a billion dollars, I could have got someone with a better out of it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Are you the, uh, the, I guess now famous officer Bubbles? Have a nice day. No? no? 
Yeah. Have a nice day. Are you? My name is A. Josephs. A. Josephs. That's Officer Joseph, sir. Oh, okay. Sounds fair. Have a nice day. Yeah, how do you feel about the, the whole uh, the, the video and everything that surfaced? Like, you know, looking back on it now. There's nothing to look back on. Did my job. I'm a police officer, right? Touch me with that bubble. We're going into custody. Do you understand me? Talking about how you, you took down your, your Facebook profile and stuff like that off there, and I mean, you know, there's been quite a bit of fallout because of that stuff, so. My private life is not open for discussion, okay? Uh -huh. Take but care of yourself. Yeah, public life, though, as a police officer. Yeah, that's different. I mean, we interviewed you a few years ago, you probably don't remember. You're calling your friend saying you're learning about the police state and you're thinking about changing your name to Boris. Be me, you got the wrong guy. I'm no, just outside of City TV. I'm getting educated about a police state. I feel like a communist already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna change my name to Boris. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Fuck. Fuck. Oh, snap, you had an arrest, eh? There's 500 of them uh, being arrested, I've heard. 500 people, that's a lot of people. 150, 300 people come down here, we're not gonna stop. So, originally the officer called and said, I need help. So a vehicle, a vehicle comes up, a mobile vehicle comes up, and then he's surrounded by people, so he can't drive anywhere. He's gonna hit people. So, really, the prudent thing to do is abandon the vehicle, go. One last well, once you do, once you do that, yeah. then, you know, they, they can do whatever they want. I mean, it's a, it's a classic for that. Civil unrest, the old rolled over police car or uh, oh, it's the burning police yeah. car. Yeah, but it's the, the, the media certainly took their photo op uh, opportunity and just that, that's all you saw on the news was the burning car. Sure. And it kind of paints uh, the whole well, protest in a bad light. You are not scared enough. You must be more scared. Freedom is a thing of the past. You are all now slaves in the new world order. What is this here? CBC News. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the propaganda piece for the Canadian government. Who wants to see me hug the CBC reporter? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Toronto is in police state lockdown. You are free to do as you are told. You are free to have your bag searched arbitrarily. You are free to hand in your identification. Please look up to your nearest CCTV camera so your face may be reported. So what we need to do is get the police on our side because they are just family men and women just like you and I. And as soon as the police stop obeying their orders, from the criminal thugs at the top, there will be no one left to defend this very small cabal of dangerous criminals who are the international financiers and bankers. This is not North Korea. This is not China. This is a civilized Western nation where people are treated with respect and dignity. And as far as I can see, 100% of the people here are peaceful and loving. Walking off entire city blocks to keep you safe. You must comply in order to remain safe. Treat us with the same courtesy we will treat you, and everything will truly be okay. And we can have a nice fun day together in the New World Order amusement park that is downtown Toronto now. Thank you. Why are you not letting people walk forward? 
very interesting thing that uh, that happened. Uh, Charlie and I were in the middle of this particular protest where everybody got uh, surrounded, and um, they had blocked the street on Queen Street leading up to Spadina, the area where one of the police cars was on fire. And Charlie got on the bullhorn and said, you know, if this line is blocked, let's go north, everybody. Oh, big Mary Fourth coming with why they're blocking us. I guess we're going to have to go that way. So everybody started to go this way, and then all of a sudden the police opened up the line and allowed everyone to go through. Almost like as if they wanted us to be in that particular area where that police car uh, was on fire. I'm so busy, dude. I'm so sorry. I've got so much stuff I need to do. I've got to be on the radio in an hour. I saw you there on the perimeter yesterday. Okay. I'd like to see your ID, please. Can I ask why? Yes. Why? I'd like to see it. Do you have a problem? Is there a reason why you wouldn't want to show your ID? Yeah, because I uh, live in Canada. I don't, I'm walking yeah. down the street with a camera, right? I'm not... Uh, Given your shirt, the proximity you were, you're videotaping yesterday down at the... Uh, yeah, tyranny. You know yeah. what tyranny is, sir? Yeah. Well, what is it? Thank you very much. I don't need a, a, a lesson in the diction in English, okay? Yes. Maximal I can tell therapy. you don't know what it is. I saw the looks you were giving me directly yesterday while we were down there. Now it's illegal to look at somebody, sir? Absolutely not. Just caught I, looked at, I looked at you in an illegal way, sir? No, no, not, not at all. I'm just saying it was... Very agitated, quite like you're starting to become right now. Not to be stopped. Not to be stopped. got here there was pretty much already a big gathering uh, the bikes were already there everybody was already sitting in uh, we were already on our way home um, we kind of just figured we'd take some pictures walk across we had to get from this side of the intersection to that side of the intersection so we decided we would just walk through take a few pictures on the way as a budding photographer thought it'd be kind of cool to get the aftermath shots down here just to see what it was like we were just walking down Queen Street like spent the day it was probably like I don't know, like five in the afternoon or in the evening. So it didn't seem it didn't seem like it wasn't too big of a crowd. It seemed, you know, peaceful. So we were kind of just observing and watching what was going on. I found out a lot of the people that were there that were stuck in were just uh, had just been walking by. Some of the people were just curious about what the protest was like because of all the stuff that happened on the Saturday. So they walked down there, and then some of the people were just like local area residents stuck in here. So they have nowhere to disperse to. Just just for the record, and here come the riot cops. is already blocked off on the south and the west side and then buses pull up from the north big greyhound buses like uh, full of riot cops all i see is like maybe three bus loads full of um, swat team members come out and we're just starting to walk up there pull up and then they all load out and start walking down and by the time we've seen that happen we're like oh crap we came back over here to kind of see what was going to happen you know if they were going to maybe try and arrest people or something and try and avoid it because they're definitely not allowing us to go that way. Oh, that's good. Corral is in the back. These guys in the north are trying to get us to move south, which was, I didn't even want to go down that far, you know? And I walk over to the east side, and uh, there's another riot squad coming in from the east. So basically, they, were, they surrounded the whole intersection. Bunch of cops there telling us to go this way. Bunch of cops there telling us to go this way. Bunch of cops there blocking off that way. I don't know where to go. Got my peace signs up. 
hoping nothing happens. Nobody knew what was going on, Nick. You'd ask a police officer or something, and they just start tapping on their uh, whatever shields, and we're like, okay, you know, you back away. There's a point where, like, where I was starting to kind of get scared when they were getting tear gas masks on over here, and um, definitely giving a feeling of threat. And so I was like, oh my God, you know, like, I'm gonna get tear gas, and I'm just here, and I didn't even want to be here. We would ask officers on one side, well, can we leave? And they would tell us to go to the other side. We'd ask them and they would say the exact same thing. Where are people supposed to go? Pardon me? Okay. All right. So I just talked to one of the police officers asking, you know, where are protesters supposed to go? Because we're all about in here. He said to hang tight. Pretty much have no place to go, so activists are pinned. It's kind of a hairy situation. Let's hope that the police officers use all their uh, best judgment and do not uh, injure any innocent protesters. Like, where are we supposed to go if they don't want us to protest? This is like really messed up, man. Half of you don't even know what the G20 is about. We give up our banking system to a foreign entity. Someone's running our country, not us. All of a sudden, at a moment's notice, we saw stormtroopers move in and close everybody off, isolate them. doesn't look good. Before we realized it, we were blocked in from uh, every direction. And then um, we were part of the small group of about 30 people that got cut off from the main four and a half hour group. And before we even knew that we were blocked in, we were blocked in. So there was no way that we could get out. What was the cry for being in here? We're peacefully protesting. Hey folks, you understand? Everybody's going to be arrested. We'll do it nice and easy, okay? We don't want to hurt anybody. But you are going to be arrested. For what? Well, I told you, conspiracy to commit mischief, so stand here and we'll take you one at a time, okay? Thank you. For, for what's, what's the charge? Conspiracy to commit mischief? We're peacefully assembling. You're interpreting it all wrong, sir. We're peacefully assembling. Nobody's conspiring for mischief. So seriously, if we wanted to get out, we would get arrested? Yeah. Out of the circle? I think so. Yeah, yeah we got to just pass it. Can I go through it? We'll let it. So what's the point?
the hippie phone. Oh, I We're a little stressed, but still lighten the situation and still, until they started dragging us away. At that point, that's when it got real. They just started to just round them up, and you know they just started treating us as cattle, and that's what we felt like. We got those civilians back there.
was standing at Queen and Sedina. I was taking pictures, and then all of a sudden I got boxed in, and I've been here probably for the past three hours, and for the past hour and a half it's been pouring rain. I'm soaking wet. There's still people who are crying. We were allowed on the east side before, and now they're cornering us in. They're boxing us in even further on the west side, and they're they're closing in further. They've got, you know, police on every corner. They've got the riot police buses. You know, they've got tons of court vans, and, you know, they've got tons of people who are in, uh, are in the plastic handcuffs right now. Somebody was walking their dog. Another couple was going out for dinner. You know, I was just taking pictures. A lot of people were just walking by, and now, and now we're stuck in the rain for the past two hours, freezing cold. This is completely unfair. This is against, you know, this is against everything that I stand for, that Canada stands for. The mayor will not comment on this. Adam Vaughn, the area councillor, will not comment on this. Uh, the police chief will not comment on this. The integrated security unit will not comment on this. Uh, no one wants to touch this. This is a situation that is uh, beyond, apparently, anyone's comment or control. I was calling my mom to see what they were saying on the news about it, whether or not they were, like, you know, giving any indication of letting us go or, or at least giving reason as to why we were stuck here. I stood out in the rain for about an hour or so like with uh, zip cuffs on the back of my hands. And, uh, so soaked to the bone, we got on a bus where they continued to put the AC on. We asked them to stop. They turned up even higher. We were in the paddy wagons for several, or for a couple hours at least, uh, soaking wet. Like I was in shorts and a tank top, you know, and the girl in the next, um, seat in the paddy wagon had to go to the washroom. She was yelling to the, like asking them, please, like, can I just go to the washroom? I really need to go to the washroom. I explained that I had to leave the group because I needed to use the washroom and could he direct me where to go. Um, the riot officer took me out of the um, took me out of the crowd by the arm and then placed me under arrest. I was taken to one of the police paddy wagons and I was um, situated among nine other girls. I asked the um, police officer where could I go to the bathroom because that was my quest of getting out of the group. He told me that I could use the paddy wagon. I said, you've got to be joking. I had no choice. I have a kidney that doesn't work properly and I've never been so disgusted and felt so violated in all my life. Because my hands were cuffed, I couldn't even help myself to prepare to do that. Mm -hmm. So I had all these strange girls do it for me. That bloody cop stood at the wired part of the door, which was wide open, and watched me urinate. He watched me urinate, and I even addressed him, and I said, that is against the law. I said, do you know what that does? He, he couldn't even imagine, and neither can other people, how, a, how that would affect someone and traumatize someone. But he didn't just do it with me, he did it with three other girls. And I don't give a shit who this guy was, a cop. I gave him no goddamn right to look at a girl urinate. Because you know what, if it was someone else in the neighborhood that was doing that, they would be picked up, thrown in jail, and charged. It's, it's the most humiliating and embarrassing thing I've ever had to say on camera. But people have to know the truth. We gained significant evidence to suggest that we had members of uh, black bloc type people that were uh, involved in the crowd mixed in, uh, and that included people who during the, during the walk uh, actually donned masks, as we saw yesterday, which was the precipitation of, of the violence that we saw. Uh, I'm also advised that we recovered some weapons along the route from, uh, from unknown sources uh, who had dropped them, but uh, they were also found. So all of this led our officers who, uh, who have been on the road trying to protect the city very diligently to believe that they had the reasonable grounds, in which they did, to believe that a breach of the peace was going to take place from the people involved in this group, including the people, um, as I said, that we believe were potentially black bloc type uh, protesters. Uh, the rain brought the, brought the uh, danger of a further breach of the peace uh, to dissipate, and after a discussion at the command level, uh, upon the direction of the chief of police, all of the people involved in this incident had been or in the process, but I'm fairly confident that everyone has been released at this point. Uh, unconditionally and as quickly as we could. What we do is in the best interest of the public and sometimes it doesn't always work out perfectly for all and, and we recognize that and I know that you do. 
Uh, hi, Tyrone, reporting for Press for Truth. I just spent the better of uh, six hours in the Toronto Film Studio. Actually, we spent about three hours in a bus just waiting to be processed. Uh, the cops basically approached on our democratic process. None of us were out of line, but they felt the need to seal us in and arrest us one by one. I was there, and I'm recording there, uh, the protest as media. Nothing wrong with that. It's built into our constitution, and uh, we just got that taken away with the Public Court Protection Act. The prison conditions were inhumane and unnecessarily abusive. There were no doors in the toilets, and most of the guards were male. We were handcuffed the entire time we were in the prison. This was not by accident. It was set up purposely to create a system of psychological violence and against men and women too, though the men and women experienced it a little differently. The place was cold. There was no place to sit or lie. And if women did act out, they were threatened with internal searches and gang rape. I, I work on um, <clears throat> violence against women and war and war rape, and threatening a woman with rape or gang rape is not a joke, and it's not funny. And the police were doing this, and this was used as a way to systematically silence women who were speaking out. This uh, draconian stuff that they passed under secret, we got to be more vigilant about, because when we don't, this is what happens. So, uh, an educated population, it's kind of what we need right now. So, if you see if you see this, this makes you mad. Do your own research and wake up, please. As we exited, there was a group of people on the other side of the road. These people were looking after the people who just got out of jail. With food, water, rides to wherever you wanted to go, legal advice, you name it, they helped you out. Thank you. We are very, very thankful. They, they actually drove us to our car, which is very nice because we had no idea where we were. And basically they said that the only uh, payment that, that they wanted in, in return, the only thing they wanted us to do in return was to tell people about what happened to us and, and what really happened at G20 Toronto. It's not an experience that I want to repeat, but it's not going to deter me from coming out the next time to peacefully protest and make my voice heard. human beings with feelings as well. I know this because a few of them were nice to me over the last few days. I wish the good ones within the Toronto Police Department could actually inspire the other ones to be nice as well. There are still good cops left. It's time for them to raise their heads and start saying something. Yeah, well you are. Thank you. It's knowledge, right? That's right, we should all have it. Yeah. Sergeant, I'd like to lend you the megaphone to yeah. get a police statement. <laughs> no, thank you. You sure? Yeah, I think your voice would come out very well. <laughs> no, thanks. We're the same, we're human beings. When you take off that uniform, you and I, we're the same. We have a common enemy. And if it's one thing I could leave you with, remember, once they're done with us, and they've got you guys to do the work for them, what do you think they're going to do to you? So I just ask you, officers of Toronto, what is more important to you, morals and ethics, or pleasing the powers that are acting in such a corrupt way? I only le could leave that for you to decide. I know you're doing your job, but at the same time, like, when is it gonna be a revolution of all, you know, like,
come on, we're all just humans. If you're live, doing something that's immoral in your life, that maybe you should consider a new occupation. <laughs> Be the one to make that change. Out, out the criminal activity or the criminal behavior and the abuse of power that, that you see and know, you know? Find a different job. Uh, what you're doing is it's not gonna benefit your children or my children in the long run. If you're a police officer, that doesn't mean you're above the law. If anything, you have to, you know, as an enforcer of the law, you have to be, you know, extra vigilant to make sure that you don't do anything illegal. Your police vehicles say to protect and serve, and ours at home in our hometown say people helping people. I only saw people helping corporations and people helping shady governments. All we ask is uh, in the next few years, as we enter this crazy, paranoid, terrorism world that you please as brothers and sisters of ours please question your orders please think about what the governments and the international bankers are asking you guys to do because you're increasingly being asked to control us just normal peaceful members of the public and it's not a canadian problem it's not an american problem it's a world problem and the true criminals are the g20 delegates and the international bankers which control them fund them and install them as puppets, as the leaders of our states. So, just to end, it's a message of peace and understanding. I'm from London, in England, and we have the exact same problems we have here. Why did the G20 decide to host itself in the middle of a major city for the need for this totalitarian clampdown? So all the best guys, we hope the day pans out peacefully for you guys as well, and we're out of here, so take care. Charlie, tell us um, what uh, what happened to you when you showed up to the uh, Toronto airport to try to go home. Yeah, yesterday at 4 p.m. Uh, I was at the airport queuing at check-in on the Air Transat flight to go back to London, as I was uh, obviously booked to do. And then at Toronto Pearson Airport, I noticed three policemen um, pointed at me from quite far back, and then they came running in and uh, grabbed me. And um, said that they had a warrant for my arrest. I said, no, 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 you, ha you have it all wrong. I've already been arrested. I've got my papers. I'm, I'm flying out now. What are you doing? This is crazy. Yes, good morning. This is a message for Charlie Veach. Uh, it's Detective Sergeant Frank Skubik calling from the Toronto Police. It's now Tuesday morning at about 9.40 a.m. Mr. Veach, the reason I'm calling is to inform you that a Justice of the Peace has issued a warrant for your arrest for the offense of personating a peace officer. If you can call me at 416-808-7399 as soon as possible, we can make arrangements for you to have yourself surrender yourself and be processed on this charge. So they cuffed me and dragged me out in front of thousands of people at the airport. And uh, the charge was uh, impersonating a police officer from uh, the first day filming I did with you, Dan. Hi, do you have some kind of certification for that? Yeah, or? we're from British Military Intelligence. I'm here with the Metropolitan Police. As you can see, so it's, uh, it's all fully authorized at the highest levels. Anytime someone personates themselves as a police officer, it's a serious offense. Uh, we take it very seriously. This entire incident we're taking extremely serious. As a result, the man was arrested and he will be facing charges. It seems ridiculous and it is ridiculous. There's Canadian case law from courts that say um, it is a crime to attempt to impersonate a peace officer. You can't pretend to be a downtown Toronto police intelligence officer. But the law is that you can impersonate all the foreign legal officers, foreign peace officers you want. Yeah, we're from British Military Intelligence. I'm here with the Metropolitan Police. You can, according to the case law, uh, pretend to be a U.S. Marshal <laughs> from Texas. But you can't do that by pretending to be a member of military intelligence. That's not an offense in Canada. Beach was released on $500 bail. His next court appearance is August 23rd. Out of my six days in Toronto for my time here with my filmmaker friends, I spent 48 hours in incarceration. I've dealt with police all around the world, and the States, and Europe, and Britain. But uh, there's something strange. I don't see the kind of, the kind of workings of uh, such a peaceful and friendly and amazing people as the Canadians and their police force. Um, maybe it is just because of the G20 in town, but your police force is extremely draconian and the criminal justice system treats you guilty until you're proven innocent. And I really felt that. And um, it just really tore a hole in my happiness for a total of 48 hours to be 
in uh, incarceration for having committed no crimes. I didn't impersonate a police officer and I didn't refuse to give ID to a, a policeman under a fake law, which now turns out wasn't brought in, wasn't enacted. What is our child going to have if this is what happens to civil rights in a weekend in our country? And I turned to my husband and I said, there has to be a way to mobilize. The media is not taking care of this. What can we do? And he opened up Facebook and he started a Facebook group. Um, the next day when I woke up, we had about 5,000 members. Within 24 hours, we had over 10,000. We are now at almost 70,000 members. So I knew immediately I wasn't alone, that just as many people felt like I did and that this wasn't going to go away. And I was going to make sure with every ounce of my power that this didn't just go away and get swept under the rug. Human rights are absolute, just like civil liberties are absolute and our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is absolute. You get those rights because you're born, that's it. There's no, as far as I'm concerned, there's absolutely no debate about it. All tyranny needs to put a foothold in a country is for the good conscience people to stay silent. Well, we will not remain silent and we will soon not forget what happened here in Toronto. We will continue to band together. We need to show them that the people and our message will not be delegitimized by political spin. We need to show them that we cannot be intimidated by their threats or slander. Show them that we are not allowing them to criminalize dissent. There's a lot that went down that the general public isn't aware of, and that's the major factor that needs to be addressed. People need to know what's happening. Thankfully, in this day and age, we are all public media. We can all Peaceful dissent is a, is a part of democracy just as much as casting a, a ballot. I hope that, um, that more politicians will kind of get on board with the idea that something outside of you know, the police investigating themselves uh, needs to come out of this, like a, a real inquiry that has, again, what I say, this real teeth to it, something that has actual power, that has subpoena power, that has the power to really question the police and look at their tactics, not just at the G20, but in general, because I think there's a larger subtext of a pattern of police aggression against you know, peaceful people. We're not going to get a true independent inquiry without that subpoena power because they lie, people lie. We don't know who gave the order, it's a multi-jurisdictional uh, setup, like who knows who was actually in charge, you know, the, the ISU, the RCMP is supposed to be in charge of the ISU, but who was giving the RCMP orders and are the RCMP giving um, municipal and like Toronto police and Peel police, are they giving them their orders? Like who is actually accountable? And what we've seen here is a picture of the police state to come. What happens when you give the police unlimited budgets? All the men they want, all the toys they want, all the machinery they want, and the right to control huge swaths of the city. That's the police state that's going to come if we give them the money to do it. Watch out for this police state. It really will come with money. And there's nothing to stop it because those values of liberty and freedom and democracy are not cherished by the police department. Our streets! 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 This is what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Our streets! 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 Our
ashamed to say that I was not a protester that weekend. I was just snatched up along with, I'm the average Canadian dude. That's who I am. Well, actually, that's who I was two weeks ago. Now I'm a protester. That's who I am now. I attended my first protest on the Monday in solidarity. Uh, and I will continue now. Uh, and my eyes have been awoken to what's going on. I didn't care much for politics. I didn't care, you know, as long as I could go to work, make my money and spend it. Now, I see the world through different eyes. I've awoken. Uh, I don't want to be part of this, this corporatized system. It's August 23rd, 2010, and we are currently standing right up front of the Ontario Court of Justice. Now, today is the day where over 300 people are going to be processed uh, for their arrests that were made uh, during the G20 Summit weekend. You rock! Yes! There are some matters that we have dealt with either through um, a outright withdrawal of the charges. In some cases, either uh, some type of a diversion from the court process was done. Uh, donations tend to be the simplest one because you can do that here, proceed with it now, give the money, and then the, the individual can, the charge is withdrawn, and they are out of the court process. But are if they you ask, responsibility? No, there is no admission of responsibility with this. It's simply a donation is done, um, and the uh, and the person walks uh, walks away from court without uh, a necessity of uh, of an admission of, of any responsibility. How many officers have been charged with assault? How many officers have been charged with assault? All right. So you had a question. How many officers have been charged with assault? Why are people having come back in October who are innocent? People who are getting murdered. Is there a single cop being prosecuted? What? Police came in and broke into my home at four in the morning. It was the gangs and guns unit with, you know, guns drawn and plainclothes officers with just their bulletproof vests and a bunch of guns pointed at their heads. The conspiracy I'm charged in is alleged to be responsible for um, everything that happened on the streets on Saturday, which is, you know, it's kind of preposterous to allege a, some kind of anarchist hierarchy. All this criminalization um, and, and the crackdown on dissent and the attacks on social movements is nothing new. And I think it's really important for people to continue the work of, of you know, challenging the system that targets people for marginalization and oppression and takes away um, from people's ability to build strong communities and to build a better world and that that is the most important thing for people to do moving forward is to continue challenging and to continue building our movements and building linkages between the various struggles that we're all involved in. We all have our opinions based on our life experience and one of the things we have to realize is that opinion is constantly being conditioned by mass media. We're constantly being indoctrinated by certain perspectives. Maybe the things I know aren't true. Maybe the paradigms that I've been used to aren't accurate. And so when I hear a thought that might sound very disturbing, might sound that may, that's not even true, may even sound like a lie, let me at least authentically consider it so that I can see all the possibilities as opposed to being so attached to one mainstream perspective. Corporate media has different responsibilities than say alternative media like this. Um, you have to you have to go into that and not be naive about it. You you have to realize where they're coming from, um, and not let it affect the validity of your message and your voice and your value system. This is about standing up for what you believe in, and it's it's hard. But just remember that nobody can tell you that it's not important. Everybody's got to start carrying around cameras. Okay. Whatever they try to tell you, you know, you can't film here, you can't film here. That's exactly when you need to hit record and you got to keep your cameras recording. I think the fact that people here took the responsibility of stopping in what were often dangerous situations to take photographs, to mount the photographs, to put them out in the public eye, speaks to a really engaged public. We are calling for a public inquiry held by the federal government. You may be aware that there are numbers of public inquiries 
already uh, started up. The um, Toronto Police Service Board has begun a public inquiry. The um, Ombudsman has become, begun a public inquiry. There's another inquiry held that the province is holding on the Public Works Act, this mysterious act that supposedly existed and then maybe didn't exist. All of these things are pieces of a patchwork, but we need to be able to put this together. I think you're probably aware that 1,100 people were arrested, the largest mass arrest in Canadian history. So to say that that was an, you know, really a, a rotten weekend is putting it mildly. It was an historic weekend. The CCLA and other groups were meeting with the police in the weeks before the G20 weekend, basically to understand what the rules would be in respect of uh, the scope of uh, peaceful protesting. At no time did either police force advise the CCLA or any other group of this regulation. Indeed, as their lawyer, I was dealing with their lawyers throughout the, throughout the legal process in the days before the G20. At no time was I advised of this regulation. The investigation that I'm reporting on today is the first of several public attempts to get to the bottom of exactly what happened here during the week of the summit. Why it happened, and what can be done to ensure it never happens again. My investigation focused on the province's role in promoting what became known as the secret security regulation, a little known and widely misunderstood legal measure that was supposed to help keep help the police keep the peace, but in my view, wound up contributing to massive violations of civil rights. Some people in the ministry were rightly concerned about the optics of using wartime legislation, but others saw the regulation as mere technicality. So the decision was made not to publicize it. Instead, they quietly handed the police extravagant sweeping powers under 71-year-old law. Powers that would almost certainly be illegal and unconstitutional under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And one of the main tenets of, of, of the rule of law is that the police will not overreact. The police will only detain people if they have reasonable and probable grounds that they have committed an offense. And our Supreme Court has been very, very clear in that regard, that these kinds of restraints are necessary on the police services, otherwise we will end up to be a police state. And, and that kind of excessive and arbitrary power which the police exercised on that occasion is shocking and appalling in this day and age. And what is more shocking is that no one has come to the fore to be accountable for this crucial undermining of the rule of law. Reviving this dormant piece of legislation, coupled with the adoption of the regulation, created a legal landscape where people were detained by the police and compelled to identify themselves, answer questions, and submit to warrantless searches, even if they simply wanted to walk away. But we also know that there may be a small number of people who use that crowd, the anonymity of a crowd, to throw rocks and to break windows and to start fires and will attempt to incite violent confrontation with the police. They had an idea that this was going to happen. In fact, that was the undertaking they gave to the judge on the injunction. We need the sonic cannon because there's going to be this rogue element. Even if it was unexpected, it doesn't give you the right to arrest hundreds of innocent people. You're within five meters of this wall, so please turn off your video camera. Okay. Public Works Act states that, so please. Because we're uh, yeah, sure your identification please. these officers. Five. Five meters from this wall. All right, we'll stop filming. But this because obviously you can't do that. There's no legal basis for the police to do that, unless, of course, they're relying on the Public Works Protection Act, which is wartime legislation. You know, the government, the ministry, had its website. The City of Toronto had a website. The Integrated Security Unit had websites. Had ads in the paper warning about street closures, things that were going to happen. Was there any at one point mention that the police had a right, 
according to a 1939 law, to arbitrarily detain citizens kilometers away from the fence, to search their belongings, to force them to identify themselves. No, at any time there was not, and that was a conscious, premeditated decision by the authorities. Apart from a coterie of senior officials in government and the Toronto Police Service, no one else was aware of the existence of this regulation or the fact that they would trigger what amounted to martial law in downtown Toronto. We're at Queen's Park, the same place, the same place they came to get the peaceful demonstration, to peacefully protest, you know? And that's what we were doing, we were peacefully protesting until we were attacked. And I want to say that I'm just one of 1,100 who was beaten and hurt and brought to jail and unfairly. When I got arrested, I had I got banned from Toronto. I had to go stay at my mom's place as a condition of my bail. And I lived literally like a block that way. 31 hours I was detained. You didn't do anything illegal? Nothing at all. I did nothing at all. All my charges dropped, everything. Uh, they had charged me for assault on a police officer public inquiry, one public inquiry, not six, is clearly necessary not only to determine what happened and to place accountability, but to ensure that in the future no government will so cavalierly gamble with and suspend our civil liberties, which are too important uh, for the politicians we apparently have. And for the citizens of Toronto, the days up to and including the weekend of the G G20. We'll live in infamy as a time period where martial law set in the city of Toronto, leading to the most massive compromise of civil liberties in Canadian history. And we can never let that happen again.